both legal and illegal, by Mark Krikorian, author of The New Case Against Immigration. He appears at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. The program is 90 minutes. Welcome all. Welcome to uh, the American Enterprise Institute um, and to this very important discussion we are going to have today with Mark Krikorian, author of The New Case Against Immigration. Uh, I am David Frum. I'm a resident fellow here at the American, Inst uh, American Enterprise Institute and I will be moderating today. Um, I will introduce the panel in just a moment. Let me say a few words in preface. Um, immigration is, of course, one of the most contentious issues in American society. Um, we see many debates about it on cable news, on the radio, and talk radio, and the magazines, and op-ed pages. And not always does this uh, discussion lead either to greater enlightenment or even to the possibility of some kind of consensus and effective public policy. Um, in this world of very emotional argument. Uh, Mark Krikorian and the Center for Immigration Studies um, really stand out. I notice that there are some um, other associates of the uh, Center for Immigration Studies here. I'd like to uh, signal Steve Camerata, who's a great producer of facts and figures and hard data on the immigration question. And we are all, all of us who work in this area are very indebted to him um, and to the Center. Uh, Mark's book is a very powerful statement. Um, that applies the techniques of social science uh, to this contentious area in the hope of leading us to better understanding and thus to better policy and thus to better outcomes uh, for uh, all American people. Um, our format today is uh, Mark will speak uh, first and then we'll have two commentators and let me do a brief introduction. Uh, Mark McCorin is of course the executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies and the author of this new book, The New Case Against Immigration. Um, speaking second will be uh, Fred Siegel, who is a polymathic expert on American um, urban issues. Uh, he is a professor at the C Cooper Union and a contributing editor to the Manhattan Institute's City Journal. Uh, between Mark and Fred is Jason Richwine, who is a PhD student at the Kennedy School of Government and who is here with us um, at, at the American Enterprise Institute as a National Research Initiative Fellow, and we are very grateful to them for underwriting his important work on immigration and IQ. Uh, Mark will speak first, uh, then Professor Siegel, uh, then Jason Richwine, and then we will move to your questions and open this up to a general discussion. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, David, and uh, thanks to AEI for uh, generously hosting this event. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick overview of the points of the book. It's available for sale outside. I'll be happy to sign them afterwards. Um, I've actually practiced what I'll write in there, um, this being my first book. As Dave, David said, there's a lot of discussion of the immigration issue. A lot of it involves more heat than light. But even the parts that, are, that have some light rather than heat focus mainly on the issue of illegality. How do we enforce the law? What do we do about illegal immigrants here, et cetera? These are important questions. But the implicit assumption, and for some people the explicit assumption, is that very high levels of legal immigration would be OK, that the illegality is the problem that we face here. And the case I try to make in my book is uh, that the answer is no, that the issue the problems we face with regard to immigration today don't just focus on illegality, though obviously that's the most pressing uh, and immediate concern. Rather, the problem is a larger one, that high levels of immigration are incompatible with the goals and characteristics of modern society. And the problem here is not that the immigrants are different from the past, that the immigrants have somehow changed, the immigration flow, that it's uh, uh, somehow dramatically less skilled or not from Europe or some other way different from previous immigration flows that were somehow better. Rather, we have changed. The changes in American society over the past century, uh, economic, social changes, governmental, technological, etc have resulted in the kind of uh, social change that results in what modernization and modernity that makes immigration a significant problem in a way that simply wasn't true in the past. Immigration was very contentious in the past. We sort of forget that, but we made it work. And uh, what we're experiencing now is a similar immigration flow into a very different country. Uh, in a word, 
Mass immigration is a phase, was a phase, like settlement of the frontier by pioneers, but a phase that shaped us and that we have now outgrown. And let me uh, touch on a few of the areas and a few of the, the, the sort of conflicts, incompatibilities between mass immigration and modern society. First, in economics. Uh, we are importing 19th century workers into a 21st century high-tech economy. And the problem here is no, there's no moral fault. The immigrants aren't somehow defective or anything else. They're really not that similar, not that different, rather, from the immigrants of the past, but we've changed. And the result is that we are flooding, artificially flooding, a low-skilled labor market. And this has a number of serious consequences. Uh, we, in a post-industrial economy like ours, in one that's changed fundamentally from anything that existed in the past, uh, this artificial flooding of the low-skilled labor market is reducing the wages of low-skilled Americans, of that portion of the American workforce that for whatever reason, ability or inclination or others, is not uh, able to succeed in the same way that those of us here are in, uh, you know, s symbol manipulation jobs, uh, as they say. Uh, it's harming their wages. It's crowding them out of the labor market. The, I didn't actually believe that was the case, but new research uh, is, in fact, showing that certain groups of American workers that are most directly in competition with low-skilled immigrants, uh, teenagers, young adult workers, uh, low-skilled uh, native-born Hispanic and black workers are, in fact, seeing their employment rates decrease. They're being crowded out of the labor market. Uh, with regard to welfare policy or government spending and government services overall, a century ago, all levels of government consumed something like 5% of GDP. Today, all levels of government combined consume more than one-third of GDP. This isn't just welfare. This is schools, hospitals, roads, all the things that government now spends money on, uses tax, pay, tax receipts and spends money on that didn't in the past. And Milton Friedman pretty much summed up the quandary here. It's just obvious you can't have open immigration and a welfare state. And again, this isn't a defect um, on the part of the immigrants. Nobody in... Sis, uh, in uh, Mitchell Khan is saying, boy, I want to come to America and get me some of that AFDC. Rather, they're immigrants, they're, they're immigrants who are coming here and despite how hard they work, end up on being supported and subsidized by taxpayers. For instance, the majority of families headed by Mexican immigrants, more than half, receive at least one major form of welfare. This is not, again, because of an unwillingness to work. This is because when you import 19th century workers into a, a 21st century society, it doesn't matter how many jobs you work and how hard you work. You cannot support your family without being subsidized by the taxpayer. On assimilation, uh, this is an area where there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding uh, of the effects of immigration, but the conflict between modern conditions and mass immigration is very serious here, and it's in two ways. Modern technology makes transnational lives possible. In other words, cheap telephone calls, the internet, cheap airfare, makes it possible for an immigrant to not really lose touch with the old country. This is not an issue of a greater or lesser willingness to become American. I often hear from people sympathetic to my point of view that my grandpa from Odessa wanted to become an American and what's wrong with these darn immigrants today? Nothing. The fact is that today's immigrants don't really have to lose touch with the old country. It's perfectly natural for uh, an immigrant to want to maintain uh, ties with uh, his home country. There's a New Yorker cartoon that really sticks in my mind of an old man, an immigrant, talking to his grandchildren at New York Harbor and saying, the country that Grandpa came from was a miserable hellhole where everybody was always happy. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I mean, at the end of Fiddler on the Roof, they're singing Anna Tevka, which is this sort of bittersweet song. They're glad to leave, in some sense, because they get away from the Cossacks. On the other hand, it was their place. So it's natural for people to want to keep a tie. But what happened in, without modern technology is that they lost those ties. And the natural process of atrophying those connections and switching their emotional allegiance to their new home was, in a sense, sort of forced on them. It isn't today. Second, the second development in modern societies that makes assimilation difficult, problematic, is that elites lose much of the self-confidence, the cultural self-confidence that's necessary to demand newcomers comply and conform with your ways rather than the other way around. And this manifests itself as multiculturalism, bilingualism, what have you. And it's, uh, the supporters of high levels of immigration are right in that this is not something the immigrants have brought with them or imposed on us. Uh, as a Wall Street Journal writer who wrote a book, sort of the diametrical opposite of mine just recently, said, keep the immigrants, deport the Columbia faculty. Well, as appealing a prospect as that might be in some sense, certainly the second part of it, um, <laughs> Uh, the, the fact remains that multiculturalism and this broader lack of cultural self-confidence is not uh, some uh, superficial phenomenon that even if we could deport the whole Columbia uh, Ivy League faculty altogether would make any difference. Because multiculturalism is deeply rooted in every institution, every congregation, every church, every daycare center, every elementary school, every corporate human resources department. However much I may decry it, and I think there are effort that it's worthwhile to make efforts to try to limit and, uh, and sort of reassert a self-confident civic culture, um, it's something that uh, isn't around the corner. And it's not something that a couple of votes or deporting a couple of professors is going to affect. And in that condition, we are importing large numbers of people who need to be Americanized. Uh, and again, this is not something the immigrants are demanding of us. My mother daughter of immigrants went to Medford, Massachusetts public schools. And her parents brought her there and essentially, in effect, said, you teach my daughter what it is to be an American. And my mom memorized the Gettysburg Address and sang Hail Columbia and all the rest of it. Immigrant parents are doing the same thing today in the LA Unified School District and the New York City public schools. They're saying, we don't know what it is to be American. We're, we have enough trouble taking care of our kids as it is. That's your job. And I'm telling you that the National Education Association is not having them memorize the Gettysburg Address, uh, to not to put too fine a point on it. And until we are able to uh, put our own house in order, uh, the, the fact is that um, uh, expecting immigrants to assimilate, and I mean patriotic assimilation, identification with the American people as their people, when going through uh, the kind of education system we have uh, developed is, is not realistic. Finally, the, f the fourth uh, conflict between mass immigration and modern society I wanted to address is security. A modern security threat is completely different from the past. Uh, in the past, we used to talk about the home front. In World War I and World War II, we talked about the home front a lot. It was a metaphor. It was a way to get people to recycle their old tires and not grumble about butter rationing. Today, the home front is the front. Because of modern communications and transportation and weapons technology, the home front is the main front. Everything else serves that purpose. Now we can disagree about how to, how, how, what means we pursue to secure the home front, but the fact that that is the security challenge is undeniable. And it's not a narrow issue of um, radical Islam. Because, the fact, because of modern technology, all future conflicts, forever, that we face, whether it's with China over the Taiwan Straits, North Korea, uh, if co the Colombian state fails and we get sucked into a war, whatever it is, the threat to the home front is ever present and is always going to be there because of modern conditions. And mass immigration undermines our efforts at security in this modern environment in two big ways. First of all, it overwhelms our ability to screen out the people we want to screen out. A century ago, there were still bad guys who wanted to come here. There were anarchists, there were wobblies, which I'd consider bad guys anyway. Uh, there were other problem people that we wanted to screen out. But because of primitive technology, there, making mistakes wasn't all that big a danger. 
there wasn't a way to coordinate um, assaults against America globally. It was very difficult. What, are you going to send a letter and wait for two months for it to cross the Atlantic? It just wasn't feasible. Also, what could a guy in a horse-drawn wagon with dynamite in the back do to blow up a wooden frame building? I mean, yeah, there was, there was actually some degree of terrorism in the past, in earlier immigration waves. But it was not in, even remotely comparable and consequential to what we face today. So screening out bad guys matters. And the immigration service today is choking on immigration. It is utterly incapable of screening out the people we want to screen out. And it's not because of stupid and lazy bureaucrats. I'm sure there's plenty of those. Um, GM's got a lot of them, too. Uh, but the fact is that uh, however effective, however efficient, however well, um, uh, you know, uh, well provisioned and resourced our immigration service is, when they have to screen well over a million legal immigrants a year, hundreds of thousands of long-term non-immigrants a year. Uh, they, they, don't, they can't do the job very effectively, and you end up with the kind of situations we've seen where bad guys use our immigration system to um, uh, every aspect of our immigration system to get into the country and to implant themselves here. The second aspect, the second conflict between security and mass immigration is that high levels of immigration inevitably create what Mao would have described as fish within which the terrorists see, terrorist fish. Ter high levels of immigration create the sea within which the terrorist fish swim. Large, unassimilated immigrant communities. Uh, President Bush, early on in this uh, war, said Al Qaeda is to crime, Al Qaeda is to terrorism as the mafia is to crime, and that's an apt analogy. And the way we overcame the mafia, quite frankly, is to some degree, or at least initially creating the conditions, was to s stop immigration, allow assimilation, end the old country norms of omerta over a period of a generation or so. And what we're doing with immigration is creating new incubators and covers where immigrants unintentionally, not through any planning, serve as cover for terrorists. And so let me just um, wrap up by saying, so what should we do? And uh, this is an answer that you often don't get from most people. I did a whole publication years ago on saying, what is your ideal immigration policy? And I asked people on all sides of the debate, and I got lots of op-eds rather than actual details, lots of op-eds without any specifics. Um, without going into a lot of detail, what we need is not zero immigration, but zero-based budgeting in immigration. Start at zero, and then determine which groups of people are so compelling to admit that we are willing to take on whatever problems immigration creates. And that would um, involve husbands, wives, and little kids of American citizens who've never been barred even in the 20s. One of my grandmothers came in after the shutoff because she married my grandfather. A handful of Einsteins, real Einsteins, not the B-plus students from Hyderabad Community College that we now take. And third, some number, which is a subjective number we determine politically, of the most desperate people in the world who don't have anywhere else to go and will never have anywhere else to go no matter what. There's a lot of people like that, and we're not taking them through our refugee program. That would still end up being 350 to 400,000 people a year. It's not ending immigration, but it is, in fact, dramatically reducing it and ending immigration for its own sake rather than determining very specific interests that would, in, that would permit the immigration of discrete groups of people. Let me um, stop there, and I'd love to hear what my uh, discussants have to say. Mark, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I'll now turn the talking stick over to uh, Fred Siegel. Thanks. Uh, make the point, uh, I agree with much of what Mark said, with a, with a few exceptions. Microphone. Oh, that's fine. I'd make the point uh, that the discontinuity Mark is laying out is not entirely accurate. What I mean by that is this. The welfare state, the modern welfare state, is in part created in response to the globalization and mass immigration of a century ago. In other words, the, this process is continuous. The growth, the growth of the national state, 
I'm talking before World War I, the years between 1900 and 1915, are in part a function of the way globalization creates far greater economic insecurity and the way immigration transforms political life in a way that people found unsettling. Much of the progressive movement is a response, in a sense, to mass immigration. So my only point here is that there's a continuity with what Mark is saying. It's not just that the welfare state we now have is problematic for immigration. It's that immigration helps produce, mass immigration helps produce the welfare state in the first place. So these things are integrally tied. Acculturation. I live in Brooklyn, um, a part of Flatbush that looks like it's Peoria. Uh, large Victorian houses, two-car garages, front porches. That's one section of the neighborhood. Overall, it's the most, it's the most diverse census tract in the United States. It's also the census tract that held three of the 9-11 bombers a few blocks from where I live, to make Mark's point about, about terror and the sea of immigrants. But leaving terrorism aside, what you see in this small neighborhood is stratified acculturation. Stratified acculturation. And what I mean by that is second generation Latino kids learning to be toughs without the work ethic of their parents, hanging out on the corners at night, pretending they're, they're hip-hop characters. I don't even know the language, I just know the gestures. You know, <laughs> avoid this bodega. This is something new that you didn't have in the earlier immigrant. You so it was true to some degree, but not to the extent we have now. One thing I always get a big kick out of is if I, I go to the uh, Arab American areas of Brooklyn, I have guys who think they're gangsters. They dress and talk and act exactly like African-American hoods. So you've got this problem of stratified, stratified acculturation, which is going to create enormous troubles down the road. And the reason for that is what I call a second generation problem. And the reason the second generation problem is so important is something I think Mark doesn't emphasize enough in the book, and I'm in broad agreement with the book. And that is the complete, and I do mean co complete collapse of the educational system. I'll give you an example of what I mean, if this sounds like hyperbole. My college, Cooper Union, admits kids in the top 1.5% of all high school graduates. 1.5%. They're all double 700s. Granted, SATs have been watered down. Not a single one of my kids know what a grand jury is. Zero. African-American neighbor talks about the school on our corner, school one of my kids went to. He says the school does exactly two things. It prepares kids to take tests, and there's a lot of gaming of the tests, outright cheating, they're giving the answers sometimes, and they build teepees. And beyond that, he can't figure out what's going on in the schools. <laughs> this collapse is profound. This is the primary mechanism of Americanization, and it is, it is I'll give you one other example so you don't think I'm, I'm engaging in hyperbole. And by the way, it's, what I'm saying is true in France and England as well. I'm giving a lecture on the Lincoln-Douglas debates. I ask my, and I say, you have to understand the peculiar geography of Illinois. It stretches from Lake Michigan to Kentucky. I can see the glazed look. Where is Illinois? Few people said it's next to Pennsylvania. A few people said it's in the Midwest. A few said it's near Chicago. <laughs> Most of the kids had absolutely no idea. Labor glut. We're, we're in the midst of a worldwide labor glut. It's, so if I'm a lower middle class worker, immigrant, and we have an enormous investment in immigrants who are already here, which will be undermined by further flows. So you can see in California how each wave, years ago I did a book on, on, partly on Los Angeles, New York, and Washington, D.C. And what I saw in Los Angeles Harbor is how each new wave of immigration 
undercut the, the, brother, the brother and brother-in-brother brother running the trucking company at Los Angeles Harbor. Because guys came in offering less and less and less. And re real wages in the harbor have gone down about 40% in the last 15 years. People don't, a culture, don't, don't adapt to the labor market. They adapt to niches. They work in niches. And I see it again in my neighborhood where Mexican-American gardeners are constantly undercutting the guy who came two months before. They come by, I'll, I'll do it for $20 less. I'll do it for $40 less. Well, that's, that's, that's fine for me, but it's not good, it's not good for their future. And this, is, this, I think, politically is the most important question. Under conditions of what I would call gentry liberalism, and that's what you're going to see in the Obama administration, gentry liberalism, mass immigration creates a servant class with serious distributional effects. What do I mean by that? I mean that if I'm upper middle class in New York City, I have people take care of my children, clean my apartment or house, prepare inexpensive meals for me, and perform all sorts of other sundry services at extraordinarily low prices. It's a collective servant class. And because you have these other two problems I mentioned, the problem of the second generation, downward mobility in the second generation, the collapse of the educational system. These kids are being trapped. And you see this particular one particular population in New York, the Dominican population. Tremendous downward mobility. One other point here. America was built on high wage labor. One of the things that strikes visitors to America in the, in the decade before World War I is that despite this massive immigration, wage levels have not gone down. They're stunned. I'm, I've been, uh, for perverse readings, rereading everything H.G. Wells wrote about the United States. And he was actually Philo American in some ways. He's stunned. Every trip he comes, he expects to see the collapse of wage levels. It doesn't happen. But it's happening now, and precisely the reason that Mark, that Mark laid out. Finally, one last point on, on, uh, on education. Because of the collapse of the educational system, K through 16, we have to import skilled immigrants. You have to import skilled immigrants. There's no way around that. It, it brings some of the problems Mark alluded to. A Chinese-American friend in California who's a, an engineer thinks Wen Ho Lee was guilty, and the FBI muffed the case. But this is, this is essentially unavoidable. Given, given the collapse of the educational system. If anything, reading Mark's book um, cheered me up because if, if he was less pessimistic than I, I thought this was a good thing. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Um, and uh, to round up the field, uh, Jason Bichuan. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, I, uh, I'm happy to be commenting on what I think is, is an excellent book uh, that Mark wrote. Um, and I don't want to bore people by just talking about how wonderful it is, so I'll just be really quick about that. Feel free. Uh, <laughs> just feel free. Uh, Mark won't be bored. Yeah. <laughs> um, two things I really like about it. Um, the first thing is that his thesis is, is deceptively simple. Um, basically what he says is, look, there are a number of disparate arguments here about uh, why we should restrict immigration. He talks about culture, you have sovereignty, you have uh, national security, labor markets, and all these things are not necessarily views shared by um, all people who oppose immigration. Um, and sometimes that can be problematic because it's sort of a grab bag approach. You know, if you don't like A, we'll just try B or try argument C. Um, but he gives this underlying justification which says, look, these are concerns of a modern society. Um, and uh, that is sort of a way to uh, bolster these disparate arguments and allow people to sort of feel as if they are part of a cohesive argument. Um, the other thing I like quite a bit, and, he, and, and Mark didn't mention this in his remarks, was the notion of post-Americans that he talks about, these sort of the transnational elites. Um, I love the, the phrase, post-American, because it, it is clearly distinct from 
anti-American, because that's not what Mark is talking about. He's not talking about people who dislike America, per se, right? He's just talking about people who have, for whatever reason, sort of graduated to an extent uh, where they no longer feel as if they are Americans, but are something else. Some of them feel as if they are citizens of the world. Um, others feel uh, like they are part of a group that does not necessarily have a geographically contiguous uh, uh, association. So one might be a Hispanic living in America, as, as Mark did allude to, rather than an American. Uh, so I, those are the things I, I like uh, about the book, and I think that it, it is a very valuable contribution to the debate. Um, I do have a uh, criticism, though, uh, a single one, although it is substantial. Despite the fact that I like the book overall, I have to say I disagree with the very first sentence of the book. Um, and that was the, the introduction, and I'll just read that quickly. As he says, What's different about immigration today as opposed to a century ago is not the characteristics of the newcomers, but the characteristics of our society. Well, I half agree with that. I, I, no argument at all for me that our society has changed in ways that make it less uh, amenable to assimilating immigrants, no doubt about it. But the argument that immigrants themselves are no different from the ones that came 100 years ago, I think, is, is quite wrong. Um, and I think that the major difference here um, is ethnicity, or race, if you will. I think that race is important for, for two main reasons. Uh, one is that uh, human beings as a species are a naturally tribal group of people. Um, we have inside, outside groups. We have families, for one, for one example, where you know, family comes first in virtually every society. Uh, and we, we tend to be very attuned to even small, trivial differences between groups. I don't mean to suggest I think this is a good thing. I, I wish we could be more universalist. Um, but the reality is that we, we are not going to be that way, and we shouldn't be basing policy on that either. Um, and the second reason I think race is important um, is that there are real differences between groups, not just trivial ones that we happen to notice uh, more than we should. Uh, race is different in all sorts of, of ways, and uh, probably the most important way is in IQ. Um, decades of psychometric testing uh, has indicated that, that in, at least in America, you have Jews with the highest average IQ, uh, usually followed by East Asians, and then you have non-Jewish whites, Hispanics, and then blacks. Uh, these are real differences. Um, they're not going to go away tomorrow. And for that reason, we have to uh, address them in our immigration uh, discussions and our debates. Um, and you can see that when you combine these two things, uh, group differences in ability combined with a natural tribal uh, disposition is going to create usually parallel cultures within a multiracial society rather than an assimilated culture. Um, and I think that is a major, major obstacle to the assimilation of today's immigrants because they are not uh, from Europe, which is, I think, a major difference, which, which Mark sort of tries to avoid discussing. Now, I, I know what the common response is here, and Mark mentions it in his book a little bit, which is to say something like, well, you know, the Irish used to be considered non-white, and, and now they're white today. And, and the Sicilians, the same way. Can you imagine the Sicilians? Well, they're white today. Um, this is based on a syllogism that is fairly obviously false, right? The syllogism, if you sort of work it out logically, goes like this. It says, uh, some people in the past who were unassimilable, uh, who were thought to be unassimilable, uh, actually ended up being assimilated. Therefore, everyone who we think is unassimilable will actually be assimilated later on. Um, obviously, you can see the fallacy here where you can't generalize this claim uh, without evidence. And I think that there are a number of counterexamples here. Um, already in America. Um, we have blacks, we have American Indians, and even early Mexican Americans uh, who have been living in the country for a long time um, and, and have not assimilated to uh, the uh, cultural mainstream as typified by white Americans. Uh, obviously, I think with blacks, we know that, uh, at least in my opinion, I think black and white cultures actually have anything diverged in the last 50 years rather than converge. American Indians have been here a long time, uh, and we still have Indian reservations. Um, and Mexican-Americans, and we, we tend to think of them as being here only recently, and I believe it's something like three-quarters of them have been uh, either first or second generation immigrants today. But they've been around since the Mexican-American War. Uh, you know, several thousand families were already living in the areas that the United States acquired during that war. Um, and uh, they've been here ever since, and I, I don't think that they have been uh, 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 defined as white, uh, certainly not by Europeans and really not by themselves either, except in the cases where they're trying to distinguish themselves from, from being black. Um, in fact, it's interesting that, that as part of the deal with Mexico, uh, the Mexican-Americans were given uh, legal um, uh, definition as white by the United States government because they needed to uh, conform to the Naturalization Act, which had reserved it to white people. But even that legal definition has not changed uh, their, uh, their status. Um, 
I don't know if Mark is going to get a chance to respond directly to what I'm saying, but um, if he does, I think it would be a good place to start uh, by answering a question I'm about, about to pose in the form of a thought experiment, um, which is just to imagine if early immigrants in the 20th century, say, you know, the Italians, the Poles, the Jews, the Irish, imagine if we replaced all of them with, say, Australian Aborigines, uh, Pakistanis, and Cambodians. Imagine if they were the immigrants in the early part of the 20th century. Can we really say, uh, with any kind of rational argument, that they today would be considered absolutely indistinguishable from the white majority, that there would be no cultural differences between them? I think it's very difficult uh, to make that argument. So I think that would be a good place to start. I, I, I see your sort of a triangulation attempt, right? Because in the book, when you say immigrants are no different from anyone else, it's, it's helpful because you can say, well, at least I'm not like rich wine um, and, and people like me. Um, that was my uh, yeah. <laughs> But nevertheless, I think it would be a lot healthier to discuss this issue, uh, the racial issue here, because look, I mean, it's here and it's not going away uh, and we can't wish it away. Uh, I, I do not believe that race is insurmountable, certainly not, uh, but uh, it is definitely a larger barrier today uh, than it was for immigrants in the past simply because they are not from Europe. Thanks. Mark, can you take a minute and a half to respond to that before we go to questions? Sure, yeah, very briefly. Um, so I'm now in the, uh, I love being in the position of the left-wing Clintonian triangulator. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, an unaccustomed position for me. But let me just, um, just briefly to what um, uh, Fred said. I obviously agree about the collapse of the education system. The only sort of uh, emphasis I would put on that is that the schools that are the school systems that are most in trouble are in fact the precise ones where the immigrants are heading to. I live in Fairfax County in Northern Virginia and um, I mean our schools are not what my mother went to in Medford, Massachusetts in the 30s either, but um, compared to the LA Unified School District or the New York City schools, uh, there's a big difference and my only point is that the, the most troubled school systems are the ones where the immigrants are going to. The problem is, um, it's, it's, in other words, it's, it's, that accentuates the problem. To address um, Jason's concern, um, I, I don't know, I mean, this isn't just triangulation on my part. Uh, as I lay out in the book, um, there's, I, I didn't come up with the terminology some social scientist did uh, about the expanding circle of the we. Who is, who is a legitimate member of the community? And it's not really just a race issue in our history. I mean, in early colonial Massachusetts, if you were a British Protestant, but the wrong kind of British Protestant, you were a Quaker, for instance, in Massachusetts and didn't get the message and leave, they hanged you. So you were not considered part of the we if you were a British Protestant, but the wrong kind. Well, eventually being some, any kind of British Protestant was okay, but being a German Protestant, that was a problem. Benjamin Franklin's famous comments, of, you know, complaint about the Germans in Pennsylvania cost him, caused him some problems when he published them. Those were Protestants he was talking about. They were German Protestants. Well, then being a Northern European Protestant was okay. Again, the circle expanded. Being a Northern European Catholic, there wasn't. That's when the Irish and the Germans got here. The Irish proved um, to be, for a variety of reasons, became uh, super patriots in, in a lot of ways and completely legitimate members of the we. Then an Eastern European and Southern European Catholics and Jews were not members of the we. Now they are, and my only point is that, that the critique, the, the, the idea that European immigration somehow always represented something that was compatible and consistent and part of the we is, is an anachronism. I mean, it's, it's looking at America in 1965 and assuming that's what we always were. The fact is that second generation uh, uh, Hispanic and Asian kids who, again, and these are the qualifiers, who are middle class, speak without an accent, have a, you know, have a job, they're white. I mean, uh, they, most Hispanics, first of all, identify themselves as white when having to choose uh, a racial identity rather than an ethnic one. And frankly, you know, really, I mean, a Asians, um, again, middle class, assimilated, native-born Americans without an accent who are Asian are socially speaking white. The real divide in our society has always been black versus non-black, not white versus non-white. And that is the challenge that we still face, have made some progress in, but not enough. And what immigration does is simply allow us to keep ignoring that. And the latest waves of immigrants are merely using that black, non-black line and putting themselves on the non-black side uh, as an assimilation tool. Uh, and so anyway, my only point is 
I would not, I don't buy the idea that um, the, the, the particular sort of def ideas of who is a legitimate member of the, within the circle of the we in 1965 is necessarily some kind of fixed point that um, can't be changed. I'd like to open the, open the floor to questions. Um, I sense there'll be a lot of them. Can I just have a show of hands right off just to give me a sense of how many people want to say something? Okay. Um, I may take these then in, in clutches of three, if that's all right with everyone, and then allow the panelists uh, an opportunity to respond to some or all of them at the same time. Uh, so let me see the show of hands again. Okay. Let me start with uh, William Niskanen, Steve Camerata, and, uh, and you, sir. Oh, okay. Solve the problem of the welfare state and immigrants. We can solve the problem of the welfare state and immigrants by having conditional immigration, in which uh, you have to be here and with with uh, with legal work experience uh, and no felony conviction for five years, for example, before you have access to the welfare state. Um, and uh, under in those circumstances, the new immigrants then impose no burden on the welfare state by themselves and they don't have kids that are of age for school yet. Uh, so you have to prove yourself in effect to get long-term citizenship by say five years of legal work experience and no felony conviction, maybe even learning English. I don't think that's a problem. Another thing that has to be taken into account is our promises we've made for Social Security and Medicare. The cost of those promises is a function of the number of workers relative to the number of retirees. And our immigration substantially reduces the cost of the promises that we've already made for Social Security and Medicare. And greatly reducing immigration would increase the cost of those promises rather substantially. Well, it's somewhat coincidental. My question is building on some of these questions. I wonder, Mark, if you could speak to the question is why these myths exist that you can somehow cut off immigrants from welfare. We tried it, it didn't work. Their rates remain very high for food and medical assistance. And the other myth I was going to ask you about, or the other issue, was why do people think that immigration you know, is helpful in terms of solving the social security crisis when all the research shows opposite of that? And I wonder if you could speak to that, particularly with, in mind to conservatives who mistakenly think this. That was, anyway. <laughs> I believe that is what is technically known in the term trade as a softball question. Uh, and would the Prime Minister agree that he is absolutely right? Uh, okay, actually about security, Chertoff and Ridge of Homeland Security have both said that they support a, a guest worker program because by focusing on illegals, you're actually going after a distraction. So I think that he would actually, they would disagree with a lot of what you said about that. And instead of the fish analogy that you gave, that they talk about the tall grass, that you have decoys in, the, in terms of the economic migrants. Now, a question for you is, how many people come into America, how many foreign nationals come into the country right now? Um, and I have the answer in case you don't know. Uh, and another thing is, I'd like to hear you discuss what you would consider to be some of the benefits of immigration. Thank you very much. And um, let me just say one thing before I turn this over to the panel. I should have said this at the beginning. I'll ask if I don't mention your name, if you would identify yourself and in an institutional affiliation if you've got one when you ask the question. So, sir, may I ask you? Well, actually, I'm Casey, Lart Casey Lartig, and I'm a freelance consultant, so no okay, affiliation. Thank you. Formerly with the Cato Institute. Okay, panel. Mark okay. Let me um, respond first to the current head of the Cato Institute. Um, the, um, the idea of being able to wall off foreigners from the welfare state is a very appealing one to not just conservatives, but to the public, much of the public at large. It's, it seems to be a way of squaring the circle. But we tried it. We tried a vast social experiment in 1996 called welfare reform. Parts of it worked. Parts of it didn't. Most of the, sa not most, but almost half of the savings from welfare reform were projected to come from precisely the kind of proposals you're outlining, which is barring access 
to the welfare system for a certain on the, until you've worked for a certain number of quarters in the United States, that sort of thing. It's a mirage. Once you let in low-skilled people into a modern society, there is no way to prevent large social costs. Let me just name one welfare program and you tell me how many politicians are going to vote to bar immigrants. <clears throat> the Women, Infants, and Children Nutrition Program. I mean, the only thing it could do is the Women, Infants, Children, and Cute Kittens and Puppies Program. It's the only thing that would you know, make it even more politically unassailable. And, I mean, all jokes aside, uh, number one, immigrants have kids. Unless you're going to have a guest worker program or some kind of conditional immigration program that is barred to women and that um, where the men are not allowed to interact with the women who are here, uh, I don't know how you prevent the creation of children. This is something that societies have tried for a long time and it doesn't work. Um, and if uh, children are brought here, that's a, an enormous source of costs, whether it's schools, health care, anything else. And just think about medical care. We have federal law, uh, the Emergency Medical Treatment Something or Other Act, which requires every emergency room to care for anybody who walks in, regardless of ability to decay, legal status, or anything else. I got to say, I kind of like living in a society that has that kind of requirement. The question is, can you sustain that if you're adding low-skilled foreigners to the country on an ongoing basis? And the answer in California, for instance, is no. They're closing emergency rooms. Public hospitals overall are closing precisely because of these demands. The, 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 the short answer is to this is there's no way you can take in 19th century workers into a 21st century society with the kind of modern norms that we have without creating costs. Quickly, as far as Social Security goes, um, so immigrants are a drain on social, or are, are a, uh, will be a drain, a mathematical drain on Social Security because Social Security is a redistributive program. Right now, illegal immigrants do in fact pay more into Social Security, uh, something the estimates are something like $7 billion. And that's money that as illegal aliens they'll never collect. So the solution then, I guess, would be to make sure we have more illegal immigration. Because as soon as they're legalized, they then acquire all of these IOUs for the future when they retire. And Social Security has even come up with estimates of what would, what would the effect on future Social Security deficits be from immigration. The, they actually project a small positive effect, very small. And it's based on unrealistic assumptions that immigrants will start paying taxes at this, at, um, uh, at the level of natives from the moment they step foot in the United States. It's obviously untrue. So, so no, it's not. It's a, it's a um, Trojan horse for Social Security. It's not a solution. Oh, uh, and then um, the question about uh, security. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm happy to use any image. I guess we'll use the image of fish swimming in the tall grass. I don't know uh, uh, if that works. I'm not exactly sure what Chertoff and Ridge are talking about. Um, the, you know, their political creatures. Uh, in the case of Ridge, not even all that effective. Uh, so the idea that they have much of us, much to tell on Homeland Security, I think, is a mistake. But the fact is we do, in fact, take in your question of how many people we take in. Something like 500 million people, 500 million entries into the United States happen each year. A lot of those are the same people. The majority of them are American citizens coming back. Then the, when you look at what's left, Half of the foreign entries are people coming in on Mexican border crossing cards, which I lay out in my book should be abolished altogether. Um, so, I mean, when you, when you shrink it down, uh, the, um, there are a lot of things we can do that will actually, I mean, the proposals I lay out in my book will actually dramatically reduce the number of, f of foreign uh, entries into the United States by immigrants and non-immigrants, but the point is that a tightly run system then enables legitimate non-immigrants, legitimate visitors, uh, student exchange, people coming to Disneyland or whatever, to actually be admitted more easily because we actually have a system to make sure that they leave, that we know when they leave. Right now we don't. I mean, it, it facilitates the travel, legitimate temporary travel of foreigners to have a tightly run and well-enforced immigration system. Jason, would you like to add a comment? 
Just briefly, I always get nervous when I hear people talk about IQ. I point out to people that when uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali took, was given an IQ test in the Netherlands, she did poorly. It's hard to imagine someone too much brighter. Uh, the other thing about immigration, the welfare state, the more poverty you import, and that's what immigration is at this point, it's the importation of massive numbers of poor people, the greater the demand for public services and the greater the displacement. You can go to Riverdale on Long Island, you can go to Tucson in southern Arizona. If you're lower middle class, you can't send your kid to public school because no one speaks English, or very few kids speak English. You can't use the public parks because people don't have backyards and they take over the public parks. They're not being particularly mean, that's just the realities of life. And crime in, in, explodes dramatically. This question of, of uh, I emphasize this because this question of stratification is going to become more and more consequential in the coming years. And immigration is going to play a key role, a key role in that, the loss, the loss of social mobility and increasingly visco increasing viscosity to our social structure at a time when the, when the meritocratic elites feel themselves justified in their elite position. This is not, not going to be a pretty picture. Let me take uh, three more then. Uh, Kim Manzi, uh, yes, uh, you'll identify yourself in, in the front row of the question. Hi, uh, my name is Jim Manzi. I'm the CEO of a software company. And, um, you know, we uh, are each year about the 10th biggest recruiter of math and computer science graduates at MIT, Harvard, Stanford, and so on. And about a quarter to a third of the people that we give jobs to require visa support to stay in the United States. And of that quarter to a third, every year there's, there's, a, there's a, a lottery that's held to determine who gets an H-1B visa. And about half of the people that we offer jobs to of that pool win the lottery and are allowed to stay in the United States. And about half then need to be sent to Toronto or London or somewhere outside of the United States for a year. Uh, and we try and eventually get them back in. And it's hard for me to conceive that the United States, under any consideration, would not be better off if these people that we have to push outside the borders got to stay here. And so I guess I wonder if anyone on the panel would support uh, an expansion of the H-1B or H-1B-like uh, program in order to get more <coughs> rather than fewer high-skilled immigrants into the United States. Um, and then, uh, would you like to name and yeah. My name is Melinda Zosh. I'm an intern at Accuracy in Media, and I went to the event that Jason Riley covered at the Cato Institute. And I'm just wondering, he argued for a free market system. He said that free markets should support immigration, and the law of supply and demand creates more jobs for immigrants. I'm curious on your comment. And I'm curious on statistics dealing with crime rates of illegals. Hi, I'm Marcus Epstein with the American Cause and Team America PAC. Um, I just wanted to ask kind of a corollary to uh, Mr. Richwine's uh, last question, which would be, um, you know, Pat Buchanan uh, very controversially said about a, you know, 15 years ago that, you know, who would be easier to assimilate, a million Zulus or a million Englishmen. Um, and today, um, uh, there seems to be actually, I've had people complain to me that they cannot get Australians or South Africans um, or British people to immigrate uh, on guest worker programs. So regardless of whether this is an IQ issue or anything like that, um, do you think that many of the problems that you discuss on immigration wouldn't apply if we prioritized ourselves back towards uh, European immigration? Um, throw this to the, the panel and uh, um, Mark, and then, and okay, then let's start with uh, Jim's question. Um, first of all, I mean, my, just to start with the mechanics without a lot of detail, the H-1B program is technically a non-immigrant visa, a guest worker visa, although in fact it's a, you know, it's a tryout immigration visa. Um, if we're going to, the, the Einsteins I want to let in, a relatively small number of actually the top people on the planet, maybe 15,000 people a year, given our, you know, under our current structure, um, should n anybody we let in like that should be let in as a free worker. The H-1B program is a captive labor program. It's sort of a golden handcuffs, you know, um, a, a, a um, uh, indentured servitude program. I mean, it really is literally indentured servitude. 
um, voluntarily undertaken for another goal and you indenture yourself. So any skilled immigrant, any immigrant at all that we let in, ought to be let in exclusively as a free worker. The question is, your basic question though is, you know, uh, there's lots of foreign students uh, at, in tech, um, uh, you know, at MIT and elsewhere, and don't we need that? And it's sort of like, uh, it's essentially what um, Fred was saying. The, the issue at um, universities, elite universities, actually is uh, you have to step back and go further uh, kind of upstream. The question is why are there so many foreign students at American universities? Uh, and we have, I would actually call, and I do call for in the book, dramatic limits on the number of foreign students admitted in the first place because the reason you have a you know, majority of, say, engineering PhDs, if that's the number, I think it's more than half, who are um, foreign students, is because those departments are admitting uh, what amounts to a kind of cheap labor from abroad, especially for graduate students. Most foreign, foreign students are graduate students. And they serve as empire building for professors who want to have more PhD candidates. Uh, frankly, we've got too many PhD candidates in the United States, nothing personal, <laughs> Jason. Um, and they serve as cheap labor, cheap research um, labor. And every single one of them is massively subsidized by U.S. taxpayers. Every one. There are no, it doesn't matter if you pay, pay full tuition or what, every foreign student is subsidized by the taxpayer. So I would actually, Jim, step back and say we shouldn't be admitting that many foreign students to begin with so there wouldn't be as large a share of foreign students at American universities. And to address specifically Fred's point about um, we need our school system, education system overall, K through 16 is collapsed, so we need to import foreign talent. It doesn't solve anything. That's the problem. I mean, it actually eliminates any incentive to fix anything because we use other people's education system, and we end up with idiocracy um, uh, uh, made functional by the admission of, you know, the, some Chinese and Indian foreign students, at least until their education systems collapse, which if they're on the path to modernity, they'll, that'll happen too. Um, the... Uh, question on open borders, uh, Jason Riley's idea that, you know, market demand should re govern immigration. There's no practical limit to the number of people who want to immigrate to the United States. Obviously not, there's, what, six billion, six plus billion people in the world who live outside the borders of the United States. They're not all going to come here. If 10% of them come here, that's 600 million plus people. And it's the desire to immigrate to the United States is quite significant. There is no practical limit to the number of people who will come here. And the idea that uh, supply and demand should govern it means that Americans should make what people in Bangladesh and Congo make, which is the inevitable result of completely evening out the labor market. I'm against that. Jason Riley's probably for it. That's okay. I don't know. But I don't, I, I, I'm not. Crime rates, quickly, this is a murky issue. We've actually got a report underway on this. Um, the data seem to show that Immigrants are less likely to be incarcerated than natives, but their children are dramatically more likely. But the data is complete garbage as a report we have. The Census Bureau admits that it's garbage. I mean, it's the people who are trying to bootstrap something that isn't there. And finally, Zulus versus Englishmen. Um, I, my sense is that uh, a million Englishmen showing up in Virginia would probably be easier to assimilate than a million Zulus, although it depends on their educational skill, if only because the cultural distance between them and natives is smaller. But with a million Englishmen in Virginia showing up all at once under current conditions, you'd have the Britannic American Anti-Discrimination League pop up. You'd have people starting agitating for ethnic grievance politics on the part of oppressed um, uh, Britannic Americans, and I say this, I'm, I'm of Armenian origin, and you know, there's even sort of, there's kind of Armenian grievance politics that's developed. So, so uh, you know, I mean, I think it's not quite as clear cut as Buchanan made it out to be. Uh, since this is uh, Canada Day, let me point out that as a Canadian, I also have a long list of grievances, and I'll be happy <laughs> to provide them. Uh, uh, Fred, Fred and Jason, do you want to comment on, uh, on the questions? Just a, just a quizzical point. I'm puzzled by people who think that open immigration and free markets are compatible. Um, the greater the density, the greater the politicization. Yeah, good point. Free markets are not compatible with high levels of density. Things get regulated. Spend time in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. 
it becomes an issue whether you can hand out uh, leaflets from Chinese restaurants, flyers from Chinese restaurants. This will be debated in the council for weeks. Politic politicization is a danger to markets. It's a danger to a free society, and it comes directly with density. And you can see this in any of the fights around the country that we've gotten into over a sprawl, which is somewhat abated right now. But it, it, it will come back. Um, on, on the issue of uh, the practical limits to immigration, I mean, th there is a practical limit, and Mark is right when he says that um, as soon as it becomes uh, no more attractive for someone from the third world to come to America compared to where he is uh, currently, uh, then that's the practical limit to immigration. Um, I, I think that the effect of that would be to, as you said, lower the, the standard of living in America, raise the standard of living in the third world countries for sure. Um, uh, that's what the free market gives you. It seems to me that there, there's more to the market, I mean, sorry, more to the immigration policy uh, than just the market. Um, there were cultural issues. Uh, I was a little disappointed to hear Mark's response to my original comments because he just kind of uh, repeated the false syllogism about uh, overcome, some people were able to overcome problems, therefore everyone will overcome problems. Um, on, on Zulus, again, uh, if, if in, in 1910 there were a million Zulus, would would today they be just like uh, the descendants of the Irish who came then? And, uh, and furthermore, uh, I, I agree that if we had a million English in Virginia, there would be an assimilation problem, but in two or three generations, it would be gone. There would, there would certainly not be any, any ethnic grievance uh, uh, push there because they would be uh, the social equals. No, there'd be, there'd be soccer riots. <laughs> well, perhaps. <laughs> Let me take uh, three more questions. I'd like to emphasize this time the back cor two quarters of the room. So if there are people in the back two quarters of the room who would like to ask a question, would you please show your hands? We have to have outraged somebody. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, then then ma'am here, sir behind you, and uh, I've taken a lot from this table, so I'm going to take uh, <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yes, yes, sir, over there. So the, the, the lady in blue first. And would you identify yourself, please? Jean Montgomery. Uh, I'm uh, uh, a little curious here as to why race is being blamed for uh, the failure to assimilate. It seems to me that uh, it's much more a socioeconomic issue that if you're a Pakistani and you come through the school system in your own country or an, an addition to uh, more education in this country that you end up just like an American and, and if you're a Hispanic uh, or your parents don't value education and you don't end up getting it for one reason or another uh, you're joining pockets of culture of poverty that we already have in the United States so I, I have, to, have to wonder here whether it's really a race thing All right, this is, my name is Pat Brown. I'm an intern at the Center for American Progress. So you were asking if you outraged anybody. So, <laughs> um, all right, so if you flash back to the early 20th century, um, nobody thought Asian Americans should come to the United States. Um, we, saw, we had the Asian, uh, or the Chinese Exclusion Act. We had the Gentlemen's Agreement with Japan. Um, and the, Mr. Rich, and you know, it's, it really was a massive importation of poverty. I think somebody said that earlier. Um, fast forward today, nobody's giving more to America than the Asian American community. Um, so if, just integrating what Mr. Kokorian said and Mr. Richwine said, um, Mr. Kokorian, you were saying that we should be able to choose which groups we were going to uh, let into the United States. And Mr. Richwine was saying that some races would be more desirable than others to have in the United States. Um, we were so wrong about it 100 years ago. Why are you in a position now to say that certain races should be let in and certain races should not? I mean, it's kind of offensive uh, on the face of it. Uh, can I just put, when, yeah. when Mark Corn was talking about groups, he was talking about ca immigration categories, not ethnic, uh, ethnic groups. Okay. Um, and yes, sir, in the, uh, on the side. Linwood Bragan, I'm a lawyer around town. <clears throat> I was wondering about what benefits that you might uh, see, if any, of barring citizenship for the offspring of legal or illegal immigrants born in this nation, uh, or at least uh, a delay of citizenship being granted to uh, the offspring of any legals who were, uh, until the naturalization process of their parents' citizenship were to come through. And uh, if you could touch on anything regarding uh, 
the chain migration as well, please? Well, um, let me start. I'm sure Jason left him something to say. Uh, I got to say, I think the race issue as it intersects with immigration, this was, I didn't mention this before, the Buchanan's question is something that people sort of think about and grapple with, but it's the wrong question because the Zulus versus British question tries to overlay immigration onto our long-standing black versus non-black divide in our society. My point is that immigrants on the non-black side of that divide have progressively been digested uh, and that the black non-black divide in our society is the thing that we've been grappling with for 350 years. Our uh, America's original sin as we put it. We've made some progress there. We haven't made that much progress and immigration impedes and interferes with our progress. So the question that's why I, 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 I think it's a sort of a, it's a misleading way to uh, address the issue. I, just to, and I'm not saying this to, you know, sort of to prove my um, uh, moral superiority, but I mean, I strongly favor, and for political reasons, if you only want to look at political reasons, as well as moral reasons, in my opinion, strictly non-ethnically based immigration admissions. Um, I mean, I'm not going to sort of refuse to talk to anybody who has a different view, but look just at the politics of it. There is no way to maintain in a modern society any uh, sustain an immigration policy that chooses people based on ethnicity. Now, that is not to say that immigration policies that are not based on ethnic characteristics won't have disparate ethnic impacts. That's the way it's going to be and that's just too bad. But um, no, I don't think there's any uh, any way that you can sustain in our society certainly um, any kind of specifically ethnically based immigration admissions policy. And the last thing on citizenship for illegals, this is a whole separate panel discussion. Um, I'm a little heterodox in my view on this issue that maintaining what the, the current interpretation of the 14th Amendment that the children of illegals get citizenship, which is not in the Constitution, it's just a practice. But it's a practice that I'm happy to keep. Um, I think changing it would be a mistake. It would take an enormous amount of political effort, and it's dealing with a symptom of broken immigration rather than actually fixing the immigration problem. Because if you reduce illegal immigration, it doesn't matter if you give citizenship to the small number of kids who are born to the remaining illegal population. And if you don't fix immigration, then all you're doing is creating 400,000 illegal aliens born in the United States every year that Congress is going to give green cards to 12 years down the road because they'll march around in front of the Capitol and and when, you know, we'll lose. So um, I think it's a mistake to even worry about that, to deal with the problem, not with the symptom. On, on the issue of, of the race-based immigration policy, uh, I, I also I share Mark's view that immigration policy should not be based on, on race. It should be based on individuals. Every person should be treated as an individual. All I'm trying to point out um, is that when you, when you have uh, substantial immigration from outside of Europe, there is an extra assimilation challenge that is here that is substantially different um, from the one that we had 100 years ago. And I really would like Mark just to, to acknowledge that fact, although he's done that to some degree today. Um, and and my, my, my view is we should go slow. Um, and he's, he's completely right. We should have uh, a, a non-ethnic based system, but we need to go slow with it so we can actually get assimilation to work. Um, race versus SES, uh, I do think that socioeconomic status uh, certainly exacerbates racial tensions. Um, but I think that there still is a a racial dimension uh, to social tension that goes beyond SES. Um, in particular, when you look at the history of European immigrants, I mean, you know, most of them were quite poor when they came, uh, much like uh, immigrants who come today. Um, but in, in the case of Europeans, they, they did assimilate, and we don't see uh, the sorts of tensions that existed back then. I would also point out that uh, when, we, when we look at uh, what people fight about, what our politics are about. Um, we, we rarely hear about, um, I don't know, for example, uh, you know, prison riots between the, 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 the prisoners who are uh, of a higher SES or something. You know, usually you're separating people by, by race. Um, it, it's something that's real and is not entirely explained by SES. Just, just briefly, it struck me the one way to talk about Mark's argument is that when unskilled immigrants arrived in 1900, they were lifted up by the growth of uh, mass production. Mass production allowed semi-skilled, unskilled and semi-skilled people to be highly productive and to receive an enormous increase uh, in wages over time. 
We now have a long tail economy. We now have a niche economy that no longer applies. And what's happening is that immigrants are being stuck in the smaller and smaller, less and less remunerative niches, which will, which will continue to produce downward pressure. Finally, just in the question of race, you will note New York, again, I'm sorry to be so New York-centric, uh, living there sort of overwhelms you sometimes. Uh, we have a substantial number of African immigrants. They behave like immigrants. They're not, they're not disproportionately de uh, on the welfare rolls or uh, problematic in any way, and they've done very well. Now, there are exceptions. The guys on 42nd Street selling you uh, f phony Rolexes. But overwhelmingly, it's been a very positive, it's been a very positive development. And it's had a positive development in the African-American world because there's this sense here, that, look, these people have come and look, look at what they've done. Uh, we've got uh, about 15 minutes left, so I'll take maybe, uh, maybe four questions to wrap up and then allow the panelists each to conclude the table. Um, yes, sir, in the tie at this table. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, and is there someone in the back, at the very back of the room? That's three, uh, the young lady here. And sir, in the back one of the blue place. Hi, my name's uh, Tom Dunn. Um, while I was studying, uh, was earning my master's at Rutgers University, I studied under Dan Titchener, the immigration scholar, and I, uh, I did a research, uh, or I did a study on a predominantly Hispanic uh, high school in New Jersey, and my, after the study where, where was... Where was the high school? Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Um, I was convinced that the high school wasn't really a school, but it was a teenage daycare center. Um, <laughs> My question is, how do you address this issue? Uh, how do you provide an education to high levels of immigrants if you do not know, in particular, what immigrants are, or the level of immigrants that are coming, since public schools cannot actually check the immigration status of their students? Hi, um, my name is Bethany Schimmel. I'm from the American Exchange Council. And here you can speak up. Is that better? Um, and my question is about foreign policy. I was wondering what the global implications of dramatically changing our immigration policy would be. Uh, Russell Wheeler from Brookings. I'd like to know from Mr. Krikorian, do you have any views, uh, your, your changes, do they, do they reach asylum policy at all? Which in the whole scheme of things is not a lot of people, but it's a contentious one. Good afternoon, William Newton with uh, Business Executives and National Security. Uh, you've all today spoken about uh, the criteria America should have for the immigrants coming there. Um, do you think that America has any obligation to the countries from which it is taking the immigrants? I think there are 17,000 Ghanaian doctors in Ghana at the moment. There are also 17,000 Ghanaian trained doctors practicing in the United States. Do you think that America has an obligation, moral or otherwise, to stop the brain drain from African and other countries. Thank you. Um, in, in, the in the interest of time here, I think what I would propose to do is, since we have 10 minutes left, um, is to divide that time, three minutes, three minutes, and four minutes with Mark uh, going last. So I'll maybe run the panel in, in, in reverse order, let Jason go first, then, then Fred Siegel, then, then Mark uh, with, to back clean up. Um, I guess I, I don't have much to say to the, most of those questions. I guess just the last one on the, the brain drain, uh, it, it is a serious issue, and, and it's one of the reasons I, I've advocated um, instead of, of taking uh, the people who are already educated, taking the educated people out of those countries and moving them, let's find the people who are really smart in the countries but are not educated, bring them to the United States, uh, and let them come to a place where they can prosper. And the Ghanaian doctors, those are some of the successful people I was talking about in New York, so it's a double-edged sword. What, I, what I'd like to know, I don't think it's been studied, is how much of this is cycled? How much, is, how much are the Ghanaians spending five years in New York going back? I don't know the answer to that. Some will settle, some will stay permanently, others will go back. Uh, I, I didn't know Perth Amboy was going to be mentioned, but I'm, I'm delighted it was. Perth Amboy is the home of modern juvenile delinquency. <laughs> I have that on the sign that you drive. <laughs> no, but they should. I don't, know, I don't know how many people here are old enough to remember a novel called The Amboy Dukes. 1950. 
I, you know, I was, I was five years old at the time, and I didn't read it yet. About three years later, I read it because it was, it was so hot, so sensuous, uh, so rough. And Perth Amboy had collapsed. Part of the reason Perth Amboy isn't as it is today is that it had already collapsed. This isn't a function of, of Latino immigrants coming in and, and turning into a daycare center. It was, it was a disaster. Uh, it was a disaster 50 years ago. It was a port. Port Amboy, once believed it or not, was a port. When that declined, nothing, nothing, ever, nothing ever replaced it. New Jersey is, a, is the soprano state, enormous corruption, patronage, etc., etc. But what you, can do, what you can do with a school like that is you can, you can increase vocational education. Part of what traps, part of what traps a, a lot of immigrant work, a, a kids, leave aside the, the, the uh, pregnant young mothers, is if, if everyone has to, because the National Education Association feels this way, it's racist that everyone doesn't take a liberal arts curriculum, and then at the same time we empty the liberal arts curriculum of all, of all content. Uh, if, if we had vocational education, when, when I went to high school, uh, we built three new, three new uh, wings in my high school, an airplane shop, a boat shop, and a car shop. And the guys, and I'm st still in touch with people, they, they got a great deal out of it. So w one thing I would do is I would bring back vocational education. Um, the other uh, piece of trivia about Perth Amboy is that it was, in colonial times, it was the capital of the colony of East Jersey. Um, the... Um, I would just, as a personal matter, I'm, I think you know, vocational education is a great idea, but I think there's a broader point here. We have no idea, really, how to fix our schools. Or let me put it this way, we don't have consensus on how to do that. You know, some people suggest uh, more vocational education, higher teacher pay, vouchers, school choice. There's a whole, there's a whole debate on this. But the take-home point for immigration is, until we figure out how to fix our own schools, what on earth are we doing dumping hundreds of thousands of kids into these schools that we have yet to figure out how to fix. Uh, the foreign policy implications is actually, that's a good question. Uh, this comes up a lot and I had a uh, boss once who uh, said, you teach people how to treat you. And we have taught Mexico to tell us how to do our immigration policy. Because when Mexico says jump on immigration, at least in this administration, we, sat, we asked them how high. And so initially, there's no question that there's going to be a lot of huffing and puffing at tougher enforcement or lower legal levels from not just Mexico, but from other countries. But it's the way it is. I mean, too bad. Um, it's not going to have lasting foreign policy implications because if you let yourself be walked all over, um, then people will walk on you. And when you stand up, they won't walk on you anymore. And that's, honest to God, what we're seeing with regard to immigration. There's a significant um, sovereignty problem. Uh, Large-scale immigration in modern conditions with, with modern communications and te um, transportation technology and with an elite loss of self-confidence doesn't just have effects on assimilation, it has effects on sovereignty. There's a whole chapter on that. I didn't go into it, but um, the, the short answer is uh, they'll have a short-term temper tantrums on the part of some people, some foreign countries, no question about it, but they're going to have to learn to live with it. The um, asylum question, I'm glad you brought it up. I actually left out the third leg of any immigration flow, ours or anyone else's, family, skills, and humanitarian immigration. Um, the, uh, I do, in fact, talk about refugee and asylum policy in some detail, and my um, basic point there is that uh, the people we, ad we give this special humanitarian status, whether they're asylum applicants who are people who have snuck in and then demanded refugee status, or people abroad who are refugees, we pick them out and bring them here, ought to be the most desperate people on the planet. I would pick 50,000 as the cap for refugee and asy asylum numbers altogether. Politically, it's a subjective thing. It's very costly, very socially disruptive, and we just have to decide as a country how many people like that we want to take. And the um, third question, the last question on the brain drain, um, I'm not sure we have a moral obligation to make sure we don't strip Ghana of all its doctors, but I think we have a practical interest in making sure that talent from developing countries doesn't all just leave. I mean, it does, in fact, um, uh, cause uh, there, there are immigrants that are less disruptive economically and in other ways than low-skilled immigrants, but um, it's in our interest that developing countries develop. Uh, and uh, so I'd have to say, if only for practical reasons, 
admitting a smaller number of doctors and nurses and others from developing countries is in our long-term interest. Let me just finish it there, and I'm happy to sign books afterwards. Um, before uh, formally thanking the panel, I'd like to take uh, advantage of a moderator's privilege to make uh, 60 seconds of comments of my own, and then, uh, I will invite you all to um, step out and, and uh, obtain copies of, of Mark's book. Um, We've talked a lot today about the nexus of race and immigration, and when we do so, we have mostly focused on the race of, of the immigrants. I would like to focus a little bit on the race and question inside the United States. To my mind, one of the most important me metrics in measuring the health of American society is not so much the income gap between African American and um, white American or European American families as the wealth gap, because this gap, which is enormous, I think it's about six or seven times, reflects the accumulated weight of what has been the ugly part of the African-American experience in this country. Um, and as that, that gap is not closing in a way that the income gap has at various moments uh, in the last half of the 20th century begun, begun to close. It is something we need to think about a lot. It is a deep moral obligation in the society and, and one that doesn't get as much attention as it should. And immigration absolutely connects to that problem of, of how quickly can we get to the day um, when the crime of slavery and the, um, the, wrong, of, uh, the wrong of segregation um, are atoned for and compensated for. Uh, I think this debate connects to a larger debate that American society needs to have about how much inequality can Republican government sustain. Uh, we are confronted, uh, I think many conservatives have been reluctant to acknowledge this, but I think it is, it is now undeniable with an extraordinary change in the nature of American society with great accumulations of wealth at the top and new accumulations of poverty at the bottom of American society. The accumulations of wealth at the top um, we may not be able to do much about without doing damage to the international uh, trade system, without, being, without doing damage to a lot of things that generate wealth for everybody. But the accumulation of poverty at the bottom ought to worry us, not just for its effect on um, the poor, although we should care about that, but for its effect on all of us. All of us, including the non-poor, have, I think, a concern to live in a society that feels like a republic um, with equality between a non-extreme top and a non-extreme bottom. Uh, finally, I would like to point out that 2008, for a time, looked like it would be the year of a great immigration debate uh, in American politics. Because of the um, workings of the primary process, it now looks almost for certain that we will not have that debate in 2008 in the primaries. However, I'm delighted we have been able to contribute a little bit to it here today at AEI. And Mark Krikorian's outstanding book um, is a big part of the cause. Uh, it carries a blurb um, on the jacket from me that says this is one of the most important public policy books of 2008. And as somebody who's pub also published a t uh, public policy book in 2008, I think that, that <laughs> blurb carries extra force. So I hope you will all address it and read it. I thank you for your attention today. Mark Krikorian is the executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies and the grandson of Armenian immigrants. He's a contributor to National Review and National Review Online. For more information, visit cis.org.